Yeah, Thierry was a uh, unique in his uh, one in the, one of a kind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Today, I want to talk with you about how orienteering looks like in France. <laughs> the prices are always are quite often they are like food. The national team is divided in three parts actually. So you have the youth team for under eighteen, and then you have junior team for like around J O years, and then the senior team. When I was doing orienteering in school, it was not on the, uh, not on our orienteering map. It was the teachers that have been drawing some sketches. Welcome, everybody. Today on the channel, I will be chatting with Isia Passet, uh, the top French orienteer in women category, according to the IOF ranking from last season. Am I right? Yeah. I yeah. So right. even though the results on, on walk, uh, as we discussed just not so long yeah. ago, were not um, as promising as we would hope for uh, because of the injuries, because of COVID and whatnot, uh, the overall performance was still good enough and you uh, you are uh, definitely the best female athlete currently in in france and you have been for several years so um i'm super happy to have you on the channel here to talk uh, we've already spent like what is it, like almost 40 minutes chatting about your career your medal during the walk uh, your upbringing, your uh, history of AOC, Jaywalk, and all the walks so <laughs> after after that. But during the main uh, part of the chat, I wanted to follow the discussion that I had, you know, several months ago now with Teresa Yanushikova when we were talking about how orienteering looks like in Czech Republic. Today, I want to talk with you about how orienteering looks like in France, because again, I think that when people will be interested in learning. Um, how orienteering looks in different countries, me definitely. So um, let's start with uh, you know some general information. How many orienteers like, do do you have like registered in France? It doesn't have to be an exact number, but more or less. How many clubs do you have? Uh, how many people are coming to like the biggest competitions that you have over there? Um, so I think in France there is a bit more than eight thousand orienteers in the whole country maybe nine thousand, something like that mm -hmm. i have no idea how many clubs <laughs> there are there are in france i mean i think it's um some areas have like many clubs and some areas in france have, have ab absolutely no clubs <laughs> so yeah it's uh it's not developed the same around the whole uh, territory yeah but uh, I will say that like the biggest national competition, then we get around 2000, 2000 people. Okay. And that's so, that's so. like around, yeah, we have two or three weekends a year that are like the most important, the French championship, some of the French championships. And that's, yeah, between 1050 and 2000, maybe when it's a good terrain and the Good timing, good okay. schedule. So you, you mean 1,500 to 2,000 people during the yeah. championship yeah. races? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that's quite a lot. More more than Poland, definitely. Like several times more. Uh, by the way, I have been to one of the orienteering competitions in France. Okay. Not not the championship ones, but you know, many years ago, I was on a business trip for a month in France, and I was like, okay, let's use the weekend to try and search for some orienteering competition. Okay. And I, I was able to start there. I even got a jar of jam as a reward. <laughs> yeah, you always get food at the end. <laughs> the prices are always are quite often they are like foods. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Another interesting thing that came to my mind is that two weeks ago I was in Tenerife, and you know, one day we were climbing this highest mountain of Tenerife called Teide, yeah. which is also the highest peak in Spain in general. And at the very top of the mountain, we spent there like half an hour uh, just sitting, chilling, eating our breakfast or second breakfast. And over there, we met a guy who was from Poland and he has been doing orienteering like 10 years back. But then he moved to France. He was there with his wife. He said, hey, I know you guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, but he also said that he lives in the France in a, in, a, in a region that is rather forestless, no forest. And the, the, there isn't much orienteering going around. So he has to travel a lot uh, okay. to, to get to some orienteering competitions. Yeah, as I said, like uh, orienteering is uh, not developed the same on the whole territory. Like there are some areas where you have no clubs and no maps mm -hmm. and uh, no one no one knows <laughs> what, are you, what orienteering is. 
Okay. But, you know, in, in the end, you have quite a big orienteering, let's call it, call it community, uh, because eight to 9,000 people is, is a solid number, you know, and um, that means that uh, you probably have quite a lot of maps that you can use. Um, if you would want to, you probably have the competitions every weekend, starting from the season somewhere in April, maybe finishing in September, October. Am I right, more or less? Yeah, I think if you're uh, if you're uh, eager to find competitions, then you can, <laughs> but you probably need to drive a lot around. So yeah, depends on where you live, but yeah, I think you can find some competitions every weekend from April to October. Correct. All right. So. How does um, the structure of your national team look like? Okay, by structure, maybe it's not a good word. Huh? So um, how big is the national team, first of all? And what are the steps to get to the national team? How many qualification races, for example, do you have? Uh, are there any other tests that need to be done to qualify? How does it look like? So we have a uh, national team is divided in three parts, actually. So you have the youth team for under 18 people and then you have junior team for like around j years and then the senior team and i think in the senior team we are in the senior like french team group we are maybe around 30 35 athletes mm -hmm. so that's like the people that aim for a spot in the international competition and then at the so with this uh, this group we usually do around four training camps that are like long weekends over the, the winter, like one per month. And then when the season starts, we have uh, test races. So that's gonna be like in two weeks now. And uh, at the end of this uh, test races, then they pick the, the team for the World Cups. And then usually like this year, the World Cups team is gonna also go to the training camps in Switzerland because mm -hmm. we don't have like the resources to bring everyone at every training camp. So like the training camp are uh, within the test races. You have to perform at the test races to get a place at the, the training camps. And so like the team, first we start with like a 30, 35 people group. Then we are like a World Cup team. So it's around 15 athletes, I would say. And then inside this uh, reduced group, we have the walk test races. So then you have even like an even smaller team to walk. Uh, so that's like the first part of the season. And then usually before the, the, the next competition over the season, we, we have another round of test races. So that's like usually two rounds of test races during the, during the year. So one at the beginning of the season, and then another one, like for the World Cups in the fall. Okay, so yeah. let me let me see if I get it right. So you get the test races to qualify, like for the, from this big group to the middle group, uh, to the yeah. World World Cup group. You said. How? But by, by the way, how many test races do you run? And is it over like one weekend or? Yeah, it's usually one weekend. So this year, since it's only forest, we have a middle distance Saturday and long distance Sunday, and uh, yeah, usually. If it's a combined World Cup, for example, and you have to run both sprints and forest, then we'll have everything on the same weekend still, and it's going to be like sprints Saturday morning, middle distance Saturday afternoon. And so three races then? Day. Yeah, three, three races okay. usually. Yeah. Okay, and then and then before walk, you have another uh, test race races weekend, I'm assuming. Yeah. Right. yeah. So you have again the the they the, they repeat the same uh schema for for, for for the walk qualification races yeah but then you said that after walk you have again some test races for, yeah, for like something at, else and the end of the of the summer like for the world cup fall like for the for the because it's like for the athletes that were for example not performing or injured in the in the spring then they, mm -hmm. they still get a shot at the world makes cup sense fall with another round of test races. Okay. And I mean, it makes even more sense now that the season is divided between sprint and forest. True. So then we have like, and I think it's going to be the same for the next years now, we're going to have one round of forest test races and then one, one round of uh, sprint test races. Mm -hmm. And then it's like the, the, this third qualification weekend is for the remaining World Cups until the end of the year. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay, that's, that's pretty smart, I think. 
Do you have any other um, tests to qualify for the national team, like physical test, race no, for, for no. 5K, 3K? We don't have those. Then, I mean, at the end of the season, they take uh, the whole season, they take the like the big picture, the whole season, the results. And uh, of course, they take into account injuries and sickness and stuff like that. And then mm -hmm. they, they make a list of like every athlete that could be aiming for a spot in the in the team next year and then they make this uh, french national team group for the like at the end of the season and that's like the group for the yeah the next season you don't have to like do test race like do uh, like physical tests or stuff like that to get into the french team it's like the base everything on the results sure that you already have um yeah i mean it's totally okay and how many people are going to walk in the French team? Uh, it depends if uh, everyone is running every distance or not. Like last year, we were three plus three at the walk sprint. And I think this, this year, they, they want to have maximum six plus six, like people choosing between races so that ev not everyone run the full the like every the full program. Actually, yeah the full program because it's probably going to be a tough one even if some can no problem but if you don't want to run the full then they plan to bring like other runners <laughs> so i think we're going to be around uh, yeah maybe between uh, eight to to like 12 athletes okay I, I well, that's that's still a merry group yeah it's still a merry group. Um, by the way, you know, when, when walk wasn't split yet, you, you had even more races and it was even more difficult to run everything, right? Yeah, yeah, true. But I was younger, so I was running everything anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. That's how it no, is. No, no, that's not true. I was usually skipping one race, like per walk. I don't think that I ran the full program. Although there, there are people that run everything yeah, and still are able to perform yeah. very well, right? Yeah, 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 true. <laughs> that's amazing. That's, uh, that's amazing because the, yeah, the previous work format, it was so many races. <laughs> um, so let's, let's take a step back. How does the introduction of young children or children in general, general um, happen? In France, in terms of orienteering, do you have any school programs uh, that you know help bring people into orienteering, or is it mostly the work of the local clubs that search for for new members? I think it's a it's a mix of both situations. I mean, there are uh, uh, orienteering is is part of the schools program, like from the age of twelve till the age of maybe 17, I think you will at least do some, I would say kind of orienteering in school because usually it doesn't really look like the orienteering that we're doing. Usually they are like in the school backyard or in the park and- the, Like micro orienteering? Not even micro orienteering because like when I was doing orienteering in school, it was not on, the, not on our orienteering map. It was the teachers that have been drawing some sketches of a football mm -hmm. field and we are doing, and they were calling it orienteering. And then all of my classmates were that, what is that what you're doing in competition? And I was like, <laughs> no, it doesn't look like that at all. <laughs> I mean, we were supposed to like write some uh, word on a piece of paper and then hide it somewhere in uh, around the football field and then uh, make a cross on the sketch and then people will have to like, search for it so i was like no that's not really <laughs> orienteering i'm doing but i mean in some schools the the orienteering is really cool because the teacher is when the teacher is usually uh, an orienteer himself or knows a bit what orienteering is then uh, it's uh, it's really cool and then usually you have a lot of young runners that start orienteering this way but when you come from a school <laughs> where the teacher has no idea what orienteering is what orienteering is and they are teaching orienteering then usually uh, it's not a good publicity for the sport <laughs> so i mean in some school it's working really well in some school yeah you don't have so many new uh, 
new orienteers coming. Uh, but but it's still cool that almost everywhere you get to you know at least touch this sport in one form or another. Yeah, at least hear the word <laughs> orienteering <laughs> at yes. least once. And then in some areas, it's mostly the clubs that are really dynamic and are organizing uh, some uh, orienteering events to to get new people coming in and uh, this kind of uh, this kind of events that. Uh, yeah, when you are like uh, in a in a city and uh, looking for a new sport to do, and then you look a bit for it, and then some orienteering clubs are quite dy dynamic at that time to like get new people coming. And I mean, usually the people enjoy it quite. Uh, <laughs> Who I wouldn't? Mean, yeah, <laughs> when you're looking for an outdoor sport, usually people are quite satisfied with uh, what they find in orienteering. Oh, okay, that's good. That's good. And um, is there anything unique about the competitions that happen in France, except from the fact that you always get food as a, as a reward? Something unique? I don't know. Like compared to any other countries? Yeah, compared to other countries you've been competing in. Maybe there is nothing. I don't know. I'm just asking. Oh, I, don't, I don't think there is anything really specific. We have great terrains, but uh, <laughs> I mean, there are great terrains everywhere. So. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about uh, these training groups that we've also mentioned earlier during the yeah. discussion, which you were the part of. of. Uh, so what are these training groups? How many of them do you have in a country? How are they organized? Do they allow you to, I think they do, to connect studying with training and how does it work? Yeah, I th that's the like... The main, the main part of the, those groups is to be able to combine both the studies and the, a really good training environment. So it's, um, it's, it's when you start to be a student, you need to be at university to start those groups. I mean, you don't go there when you are younger than this, like not when mm -hmm. you're in high school, it's when you're in university. And um, yeah, there are two of those training groups in France. So there is one in uh, Clermont-Ferrand, and then there is one that is based like between Saint-Étienne and Lyon. Like during the past, it was based in Saint-Étienne, so where Thierry Georgiou is coming from. But so year after year, there were more students that were studying in Lyon. That is like around 60 kilometers further away. Mm -hmm. Because Lyon is a much bigger city and you have more uh, like studying opportunities. So we'll say that now the group is based in Lyon, but still, I mean, if you're a student in Saint-Étienne, then you can still join this group. So there, there are two groups like this. And uh, I think the main idea at the beginning was to, since, I mean, orienteering is not super big in France. You, we don't have so many runners. So the, the idea was to like bring them together so that they, the best of French orienteers train together on the daily basis. And then this will make the, the group uh, a better group, actually. When you put all the best together, if you train together every day, then uh, the connection is really good. And then usually everything is uh, getting better and better. So that was the main, the main idea of this. Um, so yeah, they created those two groups and uh, yeah, the, um, like the group that I was part of in Lyon, it's, uh, it's mainly related to the, like a big university that is called an engineering school in France. And that's like, it's, it's, it's supposed to be a five years program, but on this specific university in Lyon, the elite athletes of any different kind of sports, they're allowed to not study 100%. And that's not so common in France as it is, for example, in Scandinavia. I mean, in Scandinavia, it looks pretty easy to decide to not study 100%, but in France, it's not so common. Mm -hmm. so th this uh, university allows you to do it and it's really well structured like the first three years you are in a class with only uh, elite sports uh, athletes for any kind of sports so in okay. my class there were some uh, climbers rowers or uh, cyclists or any kind of different sports and uh, so you are studying together but you have your own training environment, but the school makes, makes it easy to like, be able to be away for competition and uh, miss exam and uh, 
miss any kind of uh, classes and this kind of stuff. That's so that cool. Was, yeah, so that was a, that's a really great way to combine both, especially when you know that it's not so easy to be a professional athlete in orienteering. It's, uh, it's kind of nice to know that you can like study good, like you can have a good diploma and still like have a really good training environment. So do you have to pick a, a certain, you know, <clears throat> learning direction uh, or can you take any, any kind of studies on that university? Like no, can, you, can you go uh, engineering or do you have to do something connected with sports? No, it's only engineering actually. And okay. then you can decide what field you want to be in, but it has to be engineering okay. for this specific school. And that was the one I was in. But like, if you go to another... So if someone wants to study languages, it's not a place for this person. It's, uh, it's not in, in this school, it won't be possible. But I mean, this person can still be in the training group from the French Federation, like from uh -huh. the French orienteering, but he won't get um, the... Like bene beneficial treatment for, for the studies. Yeah, exactly. And then he has to organize it himself. And if the university allows him to be away and stuff like that, it will be okay. Okay. But then he has to organize everything and he has to ask for everything and maybe the school won't be okay. So yeah, it's a lot more difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit more difficult. So like if you plan to be, if you want to be an engineer, then the school I was in, if you can get in, it's a really good. <laughs> it's a really good way to combine both. And, um, and then on those training groups, there are uh, coaches that are like professional coaches. And then they like, they organize the training on the daily basis so like two strength training a week and some orienteering so they put out controls they draw courses mm -hmm. once or twice a week and uh, physical trainings track tra like track intervals or uh, appeals intervals and all this kind of stuff so like does this group also have like training camps organized yeah you usually do one training camps during the winter like in spain or portugal and uh Then you do also some, uh, you can have some training weekends and um, yeah, they organize nice. quite you know, a lot. I, I ask because, <laughs> you, you know, you probably want to go out to different maps than just, you know, whatever is around Lyon. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, in Lyon, there are no, no like not so many maps close by. So you usually have to drive in uh, closer to Saint-Etienne in the Pila mountain. So that's like between one hour and one hour and a half. So you drive mm -hmm. there once or twice a week and uh, then you also have common days of training with both training groups the one in Clermont-Ferrand and the one in Lyon that are like joining like halfway or in Clermont-Ferrand terrain or in uh, so you have this over the winter like maybe two two Saturday out of four like twice a month you do this and uh, that's awesome yeah so when you're in those training group it's uh, If the training suits you, then it's really nice because then you don't really have to think about it. Like the planning is uh, is made for you, and uh, the controls are set out every week and this kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, uh, so it's really like nice. it's like being in a sport club, really, but better, right? Because you also have a very close contact with all of those other people that are training with you. You don't just yeah. meet during the training, but you actually, you know, are in the same place all the time, almost. Um, yeah. So you have lots of uh, lo a lot more opportunities to discuss. You also have um, this uh, opportunity. So actually, in a, in a club, when you're training in a club, you own, if you have a very strong club, it's not that bad, right? But if you, for example, are a person that is significantly better in a club compared to your other competitors, it's hard to find someone who will push you, right? Yeah. And in this kind of a group, you are probably pushing each other uh, to, to be better and better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in, this, uh, in this group, especially in Lyon, I think the group is, in Lyon is a bit bigger than the one in Clermont-Ferrand. In Clermont-Ferrand, there are less studies opportunities, so there are less people joining this one. But the one in Lyon is quite big. So when I was training there at some, like some years ago, it was all of the best French girls that were in this group. So we were training every day together. So that was, that was really nice. And yeah and it's also a good you know comparison to see where you are yeah, and yeah, yeah. if exactly. you're doing well on your training or <laughs> lagging behind exactly and i i mean when i stopped being in this group i moved from lyon so now i'm training mostly alone and i had 
quite a hard time to adapt to training alone because I've never done training alone before. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like I've been training 10 years with a, with a group of people. So every time there were people to chat about the trainings and uh, everyone was doing the same intervals and stuff. So when I, it was only me <laughs> setting my own uh, schedule. Okay, I have to leave the house at this time and I will do these intervals. Then it was, it was quite tough actually. <laughs> Not yeah. so- tough, but it, I had to adapt. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it's quite probable that these groups help a lot of athletes get even better, right? Yeah. Um, but you, do you do you still have athletes that come to the top of French orienteering uh, that are not part of these groups? Probably do, right? Yeah, all... there there are some, there are some, but um, I think it's much easier when you're part of this group. Because if you are not in this in those groups, so you are not living either in Lyon or in Clermont-Ferrand, then you have to like structure your your training yourself. And depending on where you live, some clubs are quite dynamic, and then they 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 set trainings every week that are interesting and those kind of stuff. But in some places, you it's much harder to have uh, orienting opportunities every week, and. You don't have people setting controls for you all the time and this kind of stuff. So I think it's a bit more difficult, but it's possible. It's still possible. Okay. All right. So let's say you finished your studies, you were part of the group, and now you have to leave the group, I assume. After yeah, you, you, you can stay in the group if you, if you are still living in Lyon. And uh, so I stayed in the group some years after I finished my studies, actually. Uh-huh. But uh, it depends on where you find your uh, job opportunity. Like yeah, so so if you stay in a group, it means that you know you left the university, you're not studying anymore, you're not living in a dorm, I suppose. Uh, but uh, you're just attending the training sessions. How does it yeah, work? yeah, exactly, exactly. Like you can live wherever you want, and uh, like. Do you, do you still have the coach from the group? The coach from the yeah, group? Yeah, yeah, is... exactly. The coach is uh, still uh, coaching. It's still it's still uh-huh. your coach. I mean, you're still part of the group. It's just that you are not a student anymore. So sometimes you have to adapt the trainings because maybe it doesn't fit your schedule anymore. Sure. If you yeah. are working part time, for example, then then you have to skip some trainings or do them alone afterwards if you are working at the time they're training. But uh, but still, you can stay. You can stay there. For me, it was more that I moved from Lyon. So then it was no point of being in the group anymore because I will not travel every week to train with them. So Yeah, sure. Makes sense. Um, okay, so uh, let's assume that you know someone leaves the group but still wants to be a pro athlete. Like we yeah. discussed before that, you know, at, at the first year after the studies, you didn't take the step yet and you were trying to work and do orienteering at the same time. And that's super difficult. I know because, you know, uh, my wife tried to do that. And, you know, I, I know how much suffering and effort and health it, it costs. And I've also seen other examples. So it's, it's very, very hard. I mean, there are always some exceptions. So there are people that are able to do this, but it's super hard. But then you, you wanted to be a pro athlete and you've been the pro athlete for some time. Now you're again working part time. So what are the opportunities in France to be a pro athlete? What does it mean? How do you support yourself? Um, you, get, uh, you get a bit of help from, uh, from the French Federation. Mm-hmm. But I mean, financially, it's, uh, it's quite complicated to be a pro athlete. So like... For me, it was more like I decided to take take the time to be a pro athlete, but I was not like earning so much money out of it. So it was, uh, I wouldn't say that there are many, many opportunities. I mean, we don't have uh, like, I know in some countries they have some, uh, they are employed by the army or this kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. France, we don't have that anymore. Like the Francois and Thierry, they used to have some kind of contract. Yeah, I thought I remember that. I thought that Thierry yeah. was running in military champs. Yeah, but those like those full time contracts, we don't have them anymore. Now we can okay. have some uh, smaller ones where you can get some money from time to time, but it's not so. It doesn't. It's it's not enough to like, yeah, live fully out of it. 
So yeah, you can combine those like small military contracts and some help from the French government or from the French Federation and uh, this kind of stuff. But uh, of course you won't, uh, if you don't have like private sponsors or this kind of stuff, then it's, uh, it's not really possible to actually live out of volunteering for many years. <laughs> That, that was going to be my next question. Is it possible to get sponsors to, to support you financially and, and mean, be a pro athlete in orienteering? In France, I think it's quite tough because we don't have a lot of visibility. I mean, even if we, we start to have some competition on a local TV channel or on internet, then it's, it's not enough visibility for like, or for big sponsors to like, actually be a full-time pro for uh, i don't know 10 years in a row <laughs> okay so did you did you like come back to part-time job partly because it was financially not not sustainable to be a pro -athlete? yeah partly there were many many different reasons but that yeah. was also one because I, it was like i had a lot of fun being a pro it was nice but at some point i knew that i couldn't do it for many years and i didn't want I didn't want this to be like the reason to stop a career, for example. I didn't want to be pro for, I don't know, five years and then suddenly like having to stop completely to work full time because I didn't have any more money, for example. So I had this opportunity of a part time job and there was also some, yeah, some other reasons, but I decided, okay, now. I, I, I've been doing a, a pro life. It was, it was really nice, but uh, now I want to find a more, uh, sustainable life for the few, like for the next years <laughs> sure makes sense yeah all right so you know it's it seems like you know in in general in france you get quite a lot of opportunities when it comes to orienteering so you, you get to have some contact with opportunity at your primary school uh then there are quite a lot of people doing it quite a lot of sports clubs so there is that then uh, you get these special training groups that you can join and probably you have to qualify to them uh, to some extent, or yeah, is it yeah, just it's... joining a university is enough? No, no, no. You you have to be in the French team, and uh, I mean, right now it's getting tougher and tougher to get into those groups because obviously there are a lot more people asking to be mm -hmm. part of those, and uh, it costs also a lot. So they they can't have like thirty people in those groups. So sure. you you have to like run either day work as a junior or World Cups. A senior basically mm -hmm. so yeah it's, uh, okay so but really anyway you know there is an opportunity so if yeah. you're good enough if you've put enough work and maybe have some talent then uh, you have these groups and then you know after that going to senior years it starts to get a little bit more difficult now because yeah you know, when you when you finish the studies it's uh it's hard to to combine i mean the part-time job are also not so common in france or depending on on uh, what you want to work in but as i said this uh, engineering school that i was in that was really nice to combine both everyone or not everyone but there are many orienteers that want to go there because it's a uh, it's a nice school and because it's easy to combine with uh, with elite sports but then after that you're an engineer and it's really not common to work part-time as an engineer in france i mean in some countries i think in scandinavia it's a bit more common but in France, I mean, I was really lucky to find a part-time job as an engineer. So it's uh, it's quite tough when you finish. <laughs> and there are many French runners that moved to Scandinavia to be able to find some more flexible yeah, I was I was exactly going to ask yeah. that. Did you consider moving to Scandinavia at some point? Uh, I, not... I, th I think you have, I don't, maybe you still are, uh, running for IFK Getteborg. Yeah, I'm still running for them. And I've... I did an Erasmus exchange at some point during my studies, so I was living in Gothenburg for a year. So that's when I, I like started running for a EFK uh -huh. But um, yeah, I'm still running for for them. But I yeah, I didn't really consider moving after. But I mean, for a relationship reasons, I didn't want to move to Scandinavia. <laughs> I was in my sense, you know. for uh, several years, so I didn't want to. And he couldn't really move because he had some job opportunities in France so I decided but there are stay. important things and there are the most important things right <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> so I chose I, yeah, I didn't consider moving to Sweden because
because of that, but uh, there are several runners that that are like that did it, like Frédéric Tranchant and uh, Luca, my brother, is also living in Sweden, and uh, Maxime Rothurier in Finland, and uh, some other Anno Perrin moved to moved to uh, Sweden as well. So, so yeah. do you think that because of this? Well, I, I think we can call it a little bit of a change in uh, the, the elite athlete opportunities. Like you said that when when Thierry was able to run and Francois Gounod, uh, they, they were able to be a part of the military team. And I, 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 we have this in Poland, so I know how it works. And I know that it makes it a lot easier for pro athletes because then they, they get this um, source of income every month that is yeah. like almost guaranteed. And, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about how big of a money it is but it's enough to sustain you as a, as a pro athlete and if you if you're smart you can even earn more on top of it so i think it allows you to be a pro right so without it uh it's probably and you know your, your case kind of proves it that it's definitely much difficult much more difficult so do you think that this is maybe part of the reason why we don't have another Thierry Jojou on a national stage yet or would would you say that it's connected to something else? That he was like I, I a, 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 I mean, a venom. Yeah, Thierry was uh, unique in his uh, one in the, one of a kind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm not sure that uh, right now we have in France someone that is as de dedicated as him. I mean, we are like focusing a lot on uh, on Thierry, and I think we are dedicated in our way. But Thierry was he was obsessed. Like, yeah 200 or 300 <laughs> percent when everyone is already like 110 percent it was 200 <laughs> percent dedicated so and i mean yeah there are not so many countries that has a Thierry Georgiou as well so it's not uh, just in france <laughs> that like we don't have someone like this but uh, yeah i don't know i think uh, we are we are this big generation that uh, this generation of runners, as I said, that went to this engineering school because of the facilities. And now we are trying to find a way to combine it after the studies. So we are like trying stuff and some are trying to work 100% and some are trying to work 50% even if it's hard to find those jobs. And uh, some are trying to be pro as well, but without the income, as I said, so it's a bit tough situation. Also, you have to like either have your parents that help you or find some other way <laughs> to live. So I think we are, we are trying to find a way to combine it after the studies. I think right now in France, we, find, we found a really nice solution to combine studies and elite orienteering, but we need to find like more sustainable way to combine professional life or uh, yeah, with uh, professional trainings. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that lots of people watching this would uh, in the end um, say that this is very similar. In their own countries, yeah, in their own countries, uh, I guess. because you know that's that's how it is. How it is, like uh, the, I think it's partly because orienteering is not an Olympic sport, so it, yeah. it gets less TV coverage, as I mentioned, or media coverage in general, and uh, that doesn't help definitely, right? To to bring yeah. the sponsors in and to acquire more money for for the sport in general. So lo lots of countries are are struggling with it, you know, and the more popular the sport is in the country the easier it gets so i think this is why scandinavia and uh, switzerland for example yeah, yeah denmark i think as yeah. well have it a little bit easier um but you know it's just part of the game it, it is what it is and we have to learn yeah, to, to exactly. live with it and find a way we have to find a way to combine trying stuff and uh, see what works for us <laughs> okay. uh, if uh, if you would uh, have to say something that could be improved in orienteering in France in general, what would it be? Mm. What could you do better uh, as an orienteering community? As an orienteering community, I think first we could organize international competition. That would be nice. <laughs> it's been a while since the last one in France and that would be cool to, <laughs> to organize some international competition. But I think in the like the overall 
orienteering community, I think what we need to improve if we want to like step up a bit more is uh, maybe improving the, I would say the local resources. There are not so many clubs that have uh, people that uh, can be coached, that people that can set uh, nice courses and put out controls. And uh, so, yeah, I think that would be cool to improve this and improve like the level of the regional courses as well. Like sometimes the course setting is not super good, even if mm -hmm. the terrain is nice, or sometimes the, the choice of terrain is not super nice, even if like the course setter made the best out of it. So yeah, I think we could like try to improve like those resources. I mean, uh, people's resources. So like, yeah, maybe people, getting, uh, I don't know, seminars about trainings and coaching and this kind of stuff. I know that they are already, there are already some, but I think we can improve a lot on this and like having a higher level of uh, regional competition so that we have a higher level of national competition. And so the runners are better prepared for international competitions. That would yeah. be to improve. Makes sense, good point. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, last question. Okay. What do you think, as a pro athlete yourself, is the most important skill of an orienteer? Ooh. In general. In general. Mm. Ah, it's a tough question. I know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe... Maybe having confidence in yourself uh -huh. is a really good, uh, really good thing because I mean you are out there making your own choices that you have to like really trust. And uh, usually, when you have confidence that you are doing the thing right, then usually something good comes out of it. So yeah, maybe confidence because I I, I can't find like uh, of course map reading is important, but. Uh, that's kind of obvious. <laughs> like if you want to be a good orienteer, you need to be a good map reader and you need to understand sure. the yeah, 3D, I mean, I, 3D I, curves I, and all this kind of stuff. And you need to run fast as, as well. I, I, I like think, your answer. I mean, yeah, I, I like if your you answer. can top all of it with the confidence, then I think you can be a super good orienteer. I like your answer. And I'm sorry, I said it, it was the last question, but it wasn't. Because your answer <laughs> reminded me of my chat with Thierry Georgiou that I had not so long ago, really. And he also mentioned confidence and he, he also like underlined how important it is. Uh, so uh, another question I have is, uh, do the, the, like, let's call them the old guard, Thierry Georgiou, François Vargonon, Frédéric Tranchant, maybe, do they um, help the, the pro athletes or the, the, the youth nowadays get to a higher level? Do you have any contact with them? Are they part of the um, training program or maybe just, you know, peeking in from time to time, maybe some online webinars with them? Mm, not so much, I would say, because they are like coaches in their uh, own national team now. <laughs> Each of them on their side, like Damien with the Norwegian and uh, Francois with the Swiss and Thierry with the Finnish team but um, yeah I think that uh, still everyone is uh, looking up to them and every time that they are giving interviews and uh, they are everyone is listening quite carefully and uh, yeah because I think the way they, th they, they think about orienteering is uh, really interesting and they all like I think I think they put France on the picture with the elite orienteering so Definitely. At some point, they had to create something from almost scratch, not from scratch, but I mean, elite orienteering before them was not at all what it is right now. And we are quite uh, lucky to be like, we have their legacy. <laughs> I mean, so for us, it was much easier than what it was for them. So like, yeah, everyone is uh, really interesting in uh, knowing what they what they think about orient what's orienteering in France and uh, what could be improved and, uh, and all this kind of stuff. But I, I don't think that they are like giving seminars or stuff like that anymore. But that would be really interesting, I think. 
I should uh, ask the Federation to ask them <laughs> to do this. <laughs> exactly, why not? <clears throat> All right, a perfect conclusion uh, to our chat today. Thank you so much, Isia, for joining me today. It was a really great talk, as I anticipated at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having uh, me. Yeah, for everyone watching, if you've liked the, 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 the chat, um, consider subscribing to the channel, you know, like the video, hit the comment so that it's easier for other athletes to get to this, to this material because it really helps it, the algorithm. And uh, what we, I, I will definitely see you in other videos and hopefully we will get to host Isia maybe sometime again in the future, maybe when she's able to reach for even <laughs> better places at the walk, which I wish you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And, and with that, I want to add it here. Uh, have, have a good day. Uh, good luck to everyone watching. Enjoy, keep learning. And I'll be seeing you in the next video.